take a look at this graph. It's from the recently concluded UK general elections, where the Labour came into power after nearly 15 years. But what's really interesting is when you look at this section of the graph. The bar on the left represents the percentage of votes that the Labour Party got, and the one on the right represents the number of seats it'll get in the new parliament. This divide is stark. In fact, nearly 60% of the people who voted in this election didn't really make a difference on the results. Across the globe in Puerto Rico, the primary elections saw a shocking result as Congressional Jennifer Gonzalez defeated Governor Pedro Perluisi amidst controversy regarding the electronic voting machines. The machine-reported vote counts were much lower than the paper ones in some cases, and some machines reversed certain totals or reported zero votes for some candidates. This grabbed global headlines, leading to this tweet by Elon Musk calling out a ban on the EVMs in order to have a fair and free election. So I'm curious to know what is a fair election? How do you get a fair election? What are the factors at play for a free and fair election? And which of these factors can we actually change and manipulate so that we can benefit the many instead of the few? Let's figure it out. I think a better question would be, what is a fair and free election? A 2016 study evaluated elections on 10 dimensions. First, the legal framework ensures the right to vote and regular elections. Second, electoral management addresses gerrymandering and independence of election bodies, ensuring impartiality and accountability. Electoral rights ensure equal suffrage, allowing all eligible citizens to vote. Vote registers must be accurate and accessible, making it easy for voters to register. Nomination rules ensure fair candidate access, preventing rejection without valid reasons. The campaign process must be free of violence and bribery, ensuring fair competition. Media access protects free speech, preventing the ruling party from disproportionately benefiting from government media. The chosen voting process ensures security and secrecy, protecting against manipulation. Election officials must be impartial and well-trained, free from intimidation at polling places. Vote counting must be transparent and fraud-free, ensuring the integrity of the election results. More most of these are what I would consider, if I term it in a very vague sense, just fundamental rights. So the only thing that I can scrutinize even a little bit is probably the voting process. Because the kind of voting process or a voting system that a democracy chooses for itself can have a severe effect on the freeness and the fairness of an election. So I think by scrutinizing what kind of voting process a democracy chooses, we have a fair shot of assessing how fair and free an election can be. So next point is... What are the different types of voting systems in the world? Types of voting systems. Okay, that's a long, long list. I will have to narrow this down. I came across this YouTube video by a channel called Primer and it had this very fantastic analogy and I'm going to use that over here. Essentially what it does is that, let's say, let's take two of these interests on a graph. So let's say let's put education over here and let's say let's put poverty or immigration, whatever you want to say. Now, you align yourself on this two-dimensional graph according to how much you feel strongly about education and how much you feel strongly about poverty. I feel strongly about both things, so I'll put myself over here. If I don't feel so strongly about poverty and education, I'll put myself over here. And I can find myself a candidate who feels relatively strongly about both of these things. And I can find myself people who feel the same. Now, automatically through optimization, there will come a divide or segregation as to which candidate aligns with which voter. And therein, you get the majority. First, let's talk about first past the post system which is used in countries like United States, United Kingdom, and India. The system is quite straightforward. Each voter gets one vote, and the candidate which gets most votes wins the election. As you can see, vote counting is quite quick and uncomplicated, leading to quite fast election results. But that doesn't necessarily mean that things can't get complicated. We're talking about politics after all. Let's say A gets about 35% of the votes, uh, B gets about 40% of the votes and C gets about 25% of the votes. Now the most weird part about this is that the candidate that wins this sort of an election is the candidate B with 40% of the votes. Which is quite strange given the fact that if you combine candidate A and candidate C, they form the majority with 60% of the votes. So if people who have voted for C instead vote for A, it's closer to their choice of policies, so they can then make sure that they do not 
uh, oh god, okay. This is what happens, right? So if all the voters of C instead vote for A, they will make sure the candidate the least like, which is B, because it's far away from their choice of policies, they'll make sure that B does not get elected, even though B has the majority of votes. Not the majority of votes, but the most votes. So to summarize, first past the post is simple to understand and quick to implement, often producing stable governments with clear majorities. However, it can lead to disproportionate representation where the number of seats won doesn't reflect the popular vote. Smaller parties struggle to gain seats and votes for losing candidates are often wasted. And like we saw, this system can sometimes promote tactical voting and regional polarization. So despite its simplicity, first past the post may not always be the best choice. Next up is alternate voting or instant runoff elections. In this process, since the voters rank the candidates, they have the great democratic luxury of having a false safe if their preferred candidate doesn't go through. Let's pick three candidates, A, B and C, with A having 37% of the votes, B having 44% of the votes and C having 19% of the votes. Since no candidate has more than 50% of the votes, we start the first round of instant runoff. So in the first round, we get rid of the candidate with the least number of first choice votes which would be C in this case. Now, according to the graph, for the primary voters of C, ideal second choice would be A. So we run the elections again, and this time we transfer the first choice votes of C to A. Now A has 56% of the votes and B has 44. Since A now has a 50% or more share, we stop the count and declare the winner of the election, which will be candidate A. This kind of addresses the lack of representation problem in the first-past-the-post system. Herein, you can have a preference other than the two big parties. You can have an individual candidate that you prefer, and the system will still work for you. However, the system has its own challenges. Counting the votes, counting the preferences of each voters is quite a logistical nightmare. And then there's also this. And what happens if we have four candidates? Let's say A has been voted as first choice for 42% of the voters, B has been voted 26% of the times, C has been voted 15% uh, of the times, and D has been voted 17% uh, of the times. So what happens in this case is that none of these candidates have a majority by itself or like a 50% share by itself. So what happens in that case is that we conduct a second round of counting wherein the one with the lowest number of votes here has been eliminated. So C gets eliminated and its second preference, which would be D in this case, would get all of its vote share. That means means the new proportions are A has 42%, B has 26% and D now has 17 plus 15 which is 32%. Now it's quite tricky because still none of the candidates have a 50% majority and D seems to now have a larger proportion of votes in comparison to B. So B now will get eliminated for the third round of calculations and the share of its votes since B is closer to C and D than in comparison to A should go to D which means A a now has 42% of the votes and D will now have 58% of the votes which means D even though it was a minor candidate has eliminated B and A two of the bigger parties or two of the bigger candidates in this case and has been elected as the favorable candidate for this whatever this simulation is this is quite bizarre what's happening okay I should take a break I want something Hi, this video is sponsored by me. We started a small social media agency called Alt Infinity Media. We help our clients, which can be you by the way, achieve whatever they want through the social media. Well, almost whatever they want. Legally, bindingly, whatever they want. Yes. So we can help you with editing, with motion design, branding, strategy, scripting, hosting, and we can also put you in a movie if you want. We make reels, we make YouTube videos, we make podcasts, and sometimes we also make brand films. So there's something on social media that you've been trying for a while but couldn't get it done. Feel free to reach out to us. We can help you with that. Or you can also follow the link in the description. Anyways, thank you for your 30 seconds. Back to the video. I should not have taken a break. So what I'm realizing is that we are not somehow accounting for 
how intensely somebody feels about a certain policy or a certain candidate. For example, if somebody has to vote for B, somebody who's who's over here has the same amount of weightage in its vote to the same guy who's over here. So essentially what that means is that even though this guy does not feel as strongly about this candidate, his vote still counts just as the same. And I think that's where this whole game of tactical voting and people trying to outsmart themselves comes into play. The voting system doesn't really incentivize honesty if you let fear into the picture as to what can happen if the worst candidate gets elected. So a lot of people are voting based on what they don't want in comparison to what they would like. I did not expect that. Now what I am more interested about is something that I stumbled upon when I was reading about range voting. It's a system of voting or a subset of range voting to be more particular wherein the voters are much more responsible and accountable for their ideologies and their choices. And it's called quadratic voting. Sounds interesting. So instead of calculating each of these things as like a vote, you present it like a credit. So if you have 100 credits and you vote for somebody once, you can vote 100 times with spending each credit. Otherwise, if you vote for the same person twice, it costs double. So I, the maximum that I can vote for the same person, if I'm voting for the same person again and again, is 10 times. So it counts as 10 votes. So instead of utilizing or maximizing the number of credits that you have, which is 100, you are trying to make your support shown by just voting for 10 votes for one particular candidate. That kind of changes the game. That's a very good dynamic. That's very interesting. Now, as good and as fair quadratic voting sounds, it's a logistical nightmare. Firstly, imagine a democracy the size of India, where nearly a billion people are eligible to vote. It's an absolutely Herculean task to even count all of those votes, let alone forming a quadratic credit system. Current framework of the ballot system inhibits to implement this voting system in a very secure way. But thankfully, this video turned out to be an exercise of how the future of voting could look like. Electronic voting can address this problem, but it is something that is not trusted by governments pretty much anywhere. But maybe there is some sort of technology in the future that can bring all these components together and we can have perfect, secure way of voting electronically and implementing this more ambitious voting system. But for now, in the near future, I don't think it's going to be very feasible. In fact, changing electoral systems is a big task in itself. The UK held a national referendum on reform of the voting systems in 2011 after the 2010-11 election delivered a hung parliament and the Conservatives entered a formal coalition with Liberal Democrats. Okay, so they wanted to replace their first-past-the-post system with the alternative voting or, in that case, which would be the instant runoff that we discussed in this video. But the referendum was rejected by the public. 68% said no for the change and 32% said yes. That faced a lot of criticism and it says that there were was a lot of fear mongering by the politicians in order to just keep the status quo. So, what do you think? Which voting system would you prefer for your democracy? Are you happy with the first past the post or do you think the minorities need a bit more representation? Do you think there should be more candidates at play instead of just two big parties? Do you think the cost and time and effort that you have to put into to implement a system like range voting in a country is even worth it given that it's fairer than other systems, but perhaps not as much. Well, mathematically speaking, it doesn't really matter because no voting system can be absolutely fair. If you're interested, you can read more about it in the Arrow's Impossible Theorem. But if you try keep perfecting this, the worst that we can achieve is anarchy and the best that we can achieve is monarchy. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you watched it for this long, I hope that you find it worthy enough to share it with other people who would be interested in something like this. And if you find something interesting that you would like to talk about, please do comment in the comment section. I'll try my best. So thank you so much again for watching. Hopefully I'll see you again in a few days.